I trust that you had a blessed Thanksgiving time with your families and friends, a joyous time this week, and thank you for uh, uh, handling things last week, Mr. Cox, and and while I was hunting, you know, uh, I was telling somebody that I'm an a-deerist instead of an atheist. I I don't believe in deer because I never see them when I go hunting. (laughs) I, I did see a bear. So, um, but while I was hunting in this whole week, I kept thinking about Psalm 100. I I was initially going to preach from Philippians 4, had a sermon prepared for that, which you'll probably get next week, but uh, uh, kept thinking about Psalm 100. When I was growing up in West Virginia, every year at Thanksgiving time, my brothers and I would memorize this, and then at my grandparents' house, we would recite it and sing it, a great family tradition. And, you know, the New American Standard version of it uh, has a title. It says a psalm for Thanksgiving. So, I mean, obviously that's what it was written for, right? <laughs> and so it's a short psalm, very short, but five verses, and yet it's jam-packed with good instruction for how we are to exult in the Lord. You know, as good Presbyterians, we all know the Westminster Confession of Faith, the Shorter Catechism, the first question. What, what is our chief end? To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And this psalm captures the essence of that catechism. Tightly summarizing Scripture's mandate to worship and delight in God, to enjoy God. Moreover, it, it serves as a directive for our church in shaping our corporate worship. Our gatherings should be infused with, with joy When we come together, this should be the happiest time of the week when we worship together. But let's let's go ahead and read this psalm. It's not very long, but we'll work our way through it. As I said, there's a lot here in it. So Psalm 100, this is the word of God. It is eternally true and applicable for all of life. A psalm for thanksgiving. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name for the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. This is the word of the Lord. Join with me in prayer that God will bless the preaching of his word. Heavenly Father, you are holy, holy, holy. Your name should be the praise of every tongue. You deserve our song, our prayers, what we think about, what we do our entire lives. And yet, Lord, it is, it's easy for us to praise you when we are comfortable. It's easy to honor you when things go exactly as we would decide. It's easy to sing your praises and obey your word when it doesn't cost us anything. Lord, help us to sing your praises when we're tired, when our, fl- our plans fall apart, when we are hated for doing so, when it's painful, when it's costly. Holy Father, would you please give me words to say that would strengthen us in our act of obedience to what you have done for us on the cross. Fill us with faith, hope, love, and joy so that we may worship you with joyful noise and glad service. And I pray this in the name of our good, faithful shepherd, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, hey, uh, children, kids, and teenagers, I'd like you to stand up. We're going to turn this into a habit. All right. All right. Hey, uh, now I'm going to have, you're going to have a test. All right. We're going to test your education. Some of you homeschooled, some of you not. So we'll, we'll find out who, who does the best. Here it is. What are the types of sentences? What are the types of sentences? This is a grammar test. All right. What do we got? What did he say? A run on sentence. Well, that. That's what happens when Mark preaches. 
Sisters. No, that's not a part of the sentence, but that is a type of sentence. Yes. Well, back here, what do you got? What did he say? Say it aloud. That's pretty good. Yep. All right. So, okay. What is an interrogative sentence? What is an interrogative sentence? Here's a hint. I just, or interrogative sentence. There we go. Thank you. Interrogative is where they, they sit you down. And they, now, what is an interrogative sentence? Yeah, that's the one I just asked. Okay. What's an exclamatory sentence? Oh, a loud one. An exclamation, right? Okay. What's an indicative sentence? An indicative se- this is an indicative sentence. What's an indicative sentence? Yeah, it's just a straight facts, right? Telling you something. All right, who can I pick on that hasn't talked? Jeff, here's your shot, okay? Here's your shot. Jeff, tell me what an imperative sentence is. What is an imperative sentence? Tell me what an imperative sentence is. All right, we're going we're to go from you. How old are you, Jeff? 13. Okay, I'm going to embarrass you. What's your name? What? Say it aloud. Scarlet. What is an imperative sentence? A command. And how old are you? Nine. Okay, just, just saying. So these are the types of sentences, right? There are four. Exclamatory, interrogative, imperative, indicative. Now, in our passage today, we see two, two of them, kids, two different kinds, okay? We have indicatives. What are those? No. The statements, just statements. And we have imperatives. So what are those? Commands. We get two of them, right? Statements and commands. And if you look carefully at our passage, I wish it was on the screen, um, there are seven imperatives in our passage. Five verses, seven imperatives. Somebody look at your Bible and see if you can tell me what those seven are. And just give me one word, okay? The the first word of them. Somebody, Somebody shout them out. What? Okay, but what was the first one? Shout, okay, shout, serve, come, know, come on, some more, enter, give, one more, bless, that's right, shout, serve, come, know, enter, give, bless. Okay, what about the sentence that says, it's he who has made us and not we ourselves, what's that? That's an indicative sentence, okay? What about, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture? Okay, what about this one? For the Lord is good, his loving kindness is everlasting, and his faithfulness to all generations. Indicative. All right, so we just did them all. So we see there's two kinds here, right? Imperatives and indicatives. And you, and you need to pay attention to this, okay, kids and adults? Actually, all the way throughout Scripture, You'll see a lot of this, imperatives and indicatives, right? Commands or statements of truth or commands and promises. While I have you standing, I want to see if you, were, if you came to the King's Man of Daughters of Kings, see if you remember this, okay? The Westminster Shorter Catechism, the third question says, what do the Scriptures principally teach? Does anybody know the answer to that? Okay, what are the... What? Carolyn, what are, they, what are they? The scriptures principally teach. Okay, what, Jess? What man is to believe concerning God, that's your indicatives. Okay, and what? What else? And what duty God requires of man. So, children, we're going to do this all together, okay? Catechism question time. All right, question. I'll say the question. And then you'll say the answer. I'll tell you the answer first. Okay, so the answer is, the Scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man, okay? So here's the question. 
What do the Scriptures principally teach? Here's the, ready? Answer. The Scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. All right, you, you can go ahead and be seated. So there was an indicative there and an imperative. Sometimes people like to make the distinction this way. You may have heard it. It's called the law and the gospel. The law and the gospel. The th- law is the things you must do, and the gospel is the things you must believe. Now, we don't want to be too rigid about that because actually we need to believe God's commands. We need to believe that they're good and that they're right. But when you look in Scripture, you're going to see the law and the gospel. And this catechism shows us that the things that we believe, they come first, and that fuels what we do. You get that right, okay? That is Christianity. You believe and then you do. Believe comes first. The indicatives, the statements, are the things that are true. They, that's what guides what we do, the imperatives. So we have here in our passage both of these things, imperatives and indicatives. The imperatives, again, are shout, serve, come, know, enter, give, bless. And then there were indicatives. Also, we have something. Here's another grammar lesson for you today. Adverbs. Anybody know what an adverb is? What's an adverb? It describes a verb. That's right. It's a descriptive word for verb. So if you have an imperative verb like shout or serve or come, no enter, give, you're going to have adverbs like joyfully, shout joyfully. Joyfully is the adverb teaching you how to shout. And so each of these imperative verbs have qualifiers teaching us how we are to do it. So that's the end of our grammar lesson today. But I wanted you to see all that as we dive into this uh, little short psalm and see how we are to worship and what God requires of us. The manner in which we are to do it, the adverbs. Now to do what, actually? Well, What would you say is the main point, the main thesis of our passage is this, right? Worship God with joy. Worship God with joy. That's what you're created to do, to worship God with joy. Which means you've been created for happiness, for blessing, to be blessed and to be a blessing, You were created, you were called for this, for happiness, which is to worship the Lord, joy. You, this is your individual creation. And furthermore, one more, I said that was the end of the grammar, one more part of it actually, is uh, the English doesn't quite carry for us something that's in the Hebrew. And that is those words that we call imperatives like shout, all those, they're all plural, They're all plural, plural, which means it's not just for us as individuals, it's for us as God's people, as the church. Actually, as we see here, the whole world, we are to worship God joyfully. And that means we, what we do here, this passage teaches us about, that we should come and serve joyfully with gladness. And so overall, the overall theme of this psalm, simple, right? One point here. You could say it's a command, you're to be joyful. You're to be joyful. Which, if you think about it, almost seems silly, right? Who needs a command to be joyful? Who needs a command to be joyful? And here's another question. How how can we be joyful on command? How can we be joyful on command? You know, there was this uh, controversial, uh, there was a controversy on social media about a week ago involving Nancy Wilson, who's uh, Doug Wilson's uh, uh, wife, right? And so you guys, anybody see that? Where she uh, was telling this story about how she went to pick up one of her children uh, they were being babysitted, and when she went to go pick them up, they, uh, they threw a little fit. They, threw, they pouted and threw a little fit, 
and didn't want to leave. And so she took them home, took the little girl home and talked to her and gave her a spanking and said, you're to be joyful when I come to get you. And you, as you can imagine, the reaction on the internet was what? A dumpster fire, right? I mean, you already have Doug Wilson derangement syndrome, and you add that in with his wife and all this. And so, right, it was as if the universe had fallen apart. People were calling it child abuse. And their main thing was this. You can't discipline children for their emotions, like being sad to leave their friends. We can't discipline the real emotions that come from children. That's not fair. It keeps them from being genuine, right? Is that, is that true? Actually, what you know is that you actually can and you should discipline your children's emotions. A whole lot of the problem of our culture is that people don't discipline their children and teach them to control their emotions. And I can say this because God commands and he disciplines our emotions too, right? Deuteronomy 28, 47 through 48 says, Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and a glad heart for the abundance of everything. Listen to that again. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with a joyful and a glad heart for the abundance of everything. Therefore, you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger and thirst and nakedness and dire poverty. And he will put an iron yoke on your neck until he has destroyed you. The reason God disciplined his people there was because they didn't worship him with joy. So yeah, you can discipline your children when their attitudes, their emotions, and yourself. Because we're commanded to be joyful. God's people are to be a joyful people. And that means our worship time should be a celebratory, a blessing, a happy time. A time when we get to come into the presence of the Lord. <clears throat> Yet, we know we, we don't always do that, right? We don't always come here with joy. We don't always sing the songs joyfully or serve with gladness. Often, we don't feel like coming, or when we do, we can be on edge. We can be distracted by various things. It's easy to be put on edge, right? Now, we'll delve into the reasons shortly that we don't always feel like worshiping, but let's talk about the solution. If this overall command is to be joyful, where's the solution? And it's found in what? The indicatives. That's why we went through all that, the indicatives. And the indicatives are found in the middle and the end of this passage. If, uh, if you recall, I mentioned that there were seven imperatives or uh, commands and with seven, there's a middle number, which means there's three and three and one in the middle. And if you know anything about Jewish poetry, it often emphasizes the middle element. And so three commands, and then there's a fourth one, and it's followed with all kinds of indicatives. And then there's three more with more indicatives. And so the middle command, no, is the hinge for this whole passage. It's the hinge Know that the Lord himself it is, is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. And so this commands the hinge of the entire passage. It's the key to understanding how we worship God with joy. Knowing God is how we can actually be joyful. Knowing God and then understanding who we are is how we can worship with joy. Know that the Lord himself it is God. You see that? That's a very interesting phrase. Know that the Lord himself is God. It's like three times saying God, God, God. The Lord himself is God. Which is the most important point here of this whole sermon. God's God. God, Yahweh is God. And if you're going to be able to worship the Lord to have joy, this is where you start. God is God. And therefore, He deserves to be worshipped. He deserves our joy. And this realization that God is God it should move us to worship. Right? When you know who God is, it ought to move you to worship. And the whole problem is, 
We know who God is and we don't worship. That's what Romans 1 is all about. It tells us that the creation displays God's glory and then people can recognize there is a God through his power is displayed in creation. And then it says they know they should give thanks and yet what? They don't. And that's the whole problem with everything is that people are not joyful when they know God. They don't give him thanks. But this should be our foundations as Christians, knowing God. And if you know God, then you're to love God because he's worthy. No one else in the world deserves our praise as God does. God is God. That's the focus of our worship. He's the one who likely deserves it. He's the God of the universe. He's holy. He's just. He's perfect in power and being. In all of his attributes, perfect. That is, perfectly righteous. Perfectly good. Without any shadow of change. Without any shadow of evil. He is holy good. And that ought to move us to worship. And it would do so if I think if we spent more of our time focused on God than on ourselves. Consider, for example, God who has no need for creation, a God who has need for nothing. You know, we all have needs, we all have dependencies, but not God. And if we were to get a glimpse of God, just as Isaiah did, that would immediately bring us to our knees and all. And then if you were to add into this fact that God is the creator, right, he made you, he made the sunrise you see in the morning, the food you eat, the air you breathe. He created your children, each other, the cars that we drive. What do you mean he created the cars that we drive? If you ever asked that, that kid, to, they answer it that way. Well, he did. Now, you, I know you're thinking, well, they made that in the factory. Yeah, but who's the one that created the people in the factory, all the materials in the factory, and came up with that concept that came from God? Everything good comes from God. Consider the small joys of life like a gentle breeze on a warm day, the warmth from a fireplace on a cold day, the contentment that you have after Thanksgiving meal when you just sit back, all right? The energy from a cup of coffee, which I have really started to enjoy in the last couple weeks, so you can be proud of me. The reason they're clapping, if you're here, is because I've, I've, I've never drinking coffee till like two weeks ago, so, and I've drunk it every day since then. So, he's created the joy from all these things are created by God. And since he made them and he made us, doesn't he have the authority to tell us to be joyful? If you make something, you have the authority to declare its purpose. And God made us to worship him. And here's the thing, God could have made us to worship him in complete sorrow all the time. When you enter his presence, you're just to be in tears. Or he could have made you to worship him in extreme terror. And let me tell you, the wicked will worship God, and it will be in both of those ways. He could have made you to worship him in rote emotionlessness. And some of us reformed think that's what it's supposed to be. But that's not what he commands. It's not what he made us for. He created us for joy and happiness. And that ought to move you to joy and happiness, knowing that he made you for that. And then consider this, it says, he made us, not we ourselves. So he himself is God, and then not we ourselves. The real point here, the emphasis of those repeating things is this. God is God and you are not. Now, for those who reject God, that's the thing that makes them most angry. They're not God. That's why they don't praise Him and worship Him. They want to be God. But for those of us who have been forgiven, who love God, let me tell you, isn't it liberating to know that you're not God? Seriously, think about that. You're not God. Now, just take a breath and think how great that is that you're not God. So much of our stress and anxiety, the bitterness we harbor comes from our trying to take God's place. We busy ourselves trying to be God. It's like me when I get on an airplane. So I'm a very nervous flyer. 
and I'm not the pilot. But I find myself sitting there and I'm listening very attentively to every sound, every detail, the ding dong thing that it makes when they get on the thing, and then the flaps, those make noises, the, all the noises, like the, the landing gear. I'm, oh, no, what was that? And I pay close attention because if I don't pay close attention, something might happen. And the plane might come out of the sky if I don't, with all my mental power, keep it up there by listening to every little detail. And that's why I'm the most nervous flyer, because I'm not the pilot, but I think I am. It's kind of like when your wife is driving beside you in the car, right? She's not the driver, but you are. She's really the driver. You guys know what I'm talking about. That's how we are. That's how we are. We, we behave as if we are in God's position, attempting to control aspects of life that are simply beyond our control. Now, in this life, we do have a lot of immense responsibility, and I'm not advocating for carelessness, yet we often behave as though we're God. All right, we tell ourselves, it's on me to ensure everything functions flawlessly. It's on me to provide everything that must have for my family. And indeed, Scripture teaches us that if a man does not provide for his family, he's worse than an unbeliever. But the truth still stands firm. You're not God. And unless the Lord builds the house, the laborer builds the house in vain. You can toil endlessly. You can cultivate your garden. But without God's providence in the rain and the sun, your efforts are futile. Consider how anxious you get when you come to the church's walls. And again, this is not to negate our responsibilities, but to get us the right perspective. We come into worship and we fret over a myriad of concerns, often over other people's perceptions of us. So actually, sometimes it's not that we play God, we let other people be God. We, we elevate their opinion to divine status, right? Agonizing over their judgments, like if I raise my hands in worship, what will they think of me? If my children misbehave, what will that reflect about me? And such thoughts reveal a prideful heart disguised as concern for reputation and appearance. You're not God. Your children will act as children do, and their conduct might invite other people's remarks. Why does that perturb us so much that that would happen? Why would we be so like uptight if somebody were to say, your children's acting a little crazy, you need to get them under control? But it makes us so uptight, doesn't it? It's pride that fuels these fears, not the actions of others. Now, the rest of us, if we do offer people advice, we need to be careful, right? We don't want to come across and heavy-handed, but seriously, we're so uptight, a lot of times we come in worship because we think we're God or other people are God and we're not here thinking about God all right we we have a tendency to usurp God's role falsely believing we wield control and the truth is and what a relief it is we're not God we did not create ourselves he did we are his creation accountable to him you know pastors elders fellow Christians God placed them in your lives. They're instruments for your benefit. When they instruct you with the Word of God, you're to obey. Right? It's essential for you to obey God's Word. And when pastors and elders and others give you advice, you would be a fool to dismiss it lightly, disregarding their wisdom. That's a mark of a fool. And yet, you have to answer to God, ultimately, not to the pastors and the elders. And as husbands, leaders in your home, fathers, you bear the responsibility, right? You have authority then to make decisions. If you don't agree with a counsel, just say it. Don't tell everybody you're going to go along with it and then waste everybody's time. Just say, I don't agree. And, and be prepared to interact with that and, and defend your position. But you're not God. I'm not God. What a relief, right? Which is so good because none of us came here to worship you. And they didn't come here to worship me either. 
Like, if you came here to worship Pastor Spurge, seriously, how dumb would you be? And you didn't come here to worship the sound system. We, there are way better sound systems that you can worship if you wanted to worship one. You didn't come here to worship that, right? You didn't come here to worship the praise band. You came here to worship God. Now, I'm not saying our, our worship should not be beautiful and all these things. Actually, here in just a second, I'm going to talk about that. But the point is, we're not God. He's God. Get that right. And if you can't get that right, you're not going to get anything else right. And if you get that right, joy is going to come. When you're here to worship God, when you realize the stressful things that happen at your house are often His goodness, His kindness, and His way for you to work and be found faithful, to make you more like Christ, to make you to be the more kind person who can have joy and be jo joyful, right? All the bad things, the, the, uh, the sleepless nights, all those things, they're not meant for your destruction. They're for your good. Because he's God, I'm not. Furthermore, if you see here in this indicative about we do not create ourselves, what's the next thing say? We are his people. So we're not God, we're his. And that also means that God is God, God is creator, but God's not distant. All right? We, we have this... We have a relationship that transforms terror into reverence, distant all into intimate worship. And when you realize your fallibility, your frequent failures against God, and yet you know that he claims you as his own, oh, isn't that joyful? Think about yourself, how sinful you are, and yet you are his. His cherished creation, called to worship him in joy and truth. We're the sheep of his pasture. Consider the profound grace in being shepherded by God himself. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside still waters. Jesus is the good shepherd. Right, that ought to make us humble. Right, because we also we know our sinfulness, our foolishness, and yet astonishingly, he causes his people and he shepherds us. He guides us away from danger. He pulls the little thorns and the things out of our fur and protects us from predators. And when you think about that and his goodness, how can we not worship? You know, I think our reluctance to be likened to sheep again stems from pride. But the truth is, we're his flock. And we do some pretty dumb, stupid things. I watched this video of this sheep that jumped into a ditch, and they were spinning, they spent like a long time getting this, this sheep that was head first stuck in a ditch out of this sheep. And you can go watch it, it's a perfect video of what a church is. And they pulled this sheep right out of the ditch, and it bounced around joyfully for two seconds, and then went, went head first into the ditch just a little bit further up. Same predicament. That is us. Which is why we often don't come to worship him with joy because we're just dumb sheep. We do stupid things. We jump in ditches. Often our lack of joy in worship stems from being ensnared in self-made ditches, trapped in unrepentant sin. Our minds, tainted by worldly filth, render us unprepared for worship. And yet he's our shepherd. And as his people under his shepherding care, that gives us hope because when we're stuck, we can cry, God, help me. And then you know that you won't be left in the ditch because he will come and rescue you. He's faithful and just, always ready to redeem us from our own foolishness. And that truth should fill you with reverence and gratitude, transforming our worship into a joyful celebration of his mercy and goodness. But there's more. It says, for the Lord is good. Skip on down after a couple of imperatives. Verse 5, the Lord is good. He's not only our God, our creator, our shepherd, but he's intrinsically good. The lie of the devil is always aimed at God's goodness. However, God is good and his loving kindness is everlasting. Which means he never stops loving us. He never changes. He's faithful and just forgiving our sins. So, why do we hesitate to confess our sins? 
why do we hesitate? Because we're dumb. We're an idiot, right? But don't be an idiot. Don't be a fool. Confess your sins. He's faithful and just. We get to come into his gates. Isn't that amazing? Into his very presence. I get to come into the gates of the Lord, the church of God. And when I know my thoughts, I, I know how often I succumb to temptation. Like, I think about all the things that I've done in my life. And if, if oftentimes, like, non-Christians get this hope that, like, all their good deeds and their bad deeds will weigh out. And they're just idiots because you think about all your bad deeds and all your good deeds, and you know which one is going to be heavier, I lose, you lose your patience with your kids, your wife. Just think of the dumb things we do as sheep, but God's loving kindness remains everlasting. His loving kindness endures forever. And that phrase, his loving kindness, that, that's all found throughout all of Scripture. It's actually this Hebrew word called hesed, or chesed. You've got to get the back of the throat to really get it. It means his rich, encompassing love, kindness, blessing, and mercy. It's often translated as loving kindness or mercy. So you think about Ephesians 2. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, but God being rich in mercy. That Greek word for mercy there, when the Septuagint translates loving kindness, is the same word. God rich in his loving kindness because of his great love which he loved us and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And then you know this part probably my favorite part in all of Scripture. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So he's already saved us. He seated us. Now here's why. Here's why he did all that, okay? You know, why did God save me? You, all, you might want to know. Well, here it is. So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. A sinner like us, he saved us so that in the future he can show us infinite riches of his grace and mercy. God is infinite and eternal, and so it makes sense that his grace and mercy would be infinite and eternal. You can't search the end of it. It's everlasting. There is no end to God's goodness to us. And then it says his faithfulness is to all generations. Consider this enduring blessing. God's faithfulness is to all generations. His mercy is no end and every generation. This is constancy for our hope. Because like if God was changeable, man, right? Imagine if God's love could fluctuate. Loving us one moment and not the next. Well, you know how unlovable you are and how easy for it would be to somebody to fall out of love. But God doesn't change because his faithfulness is unchanging. It's not confined just to past generations, not confined to our forefathers, not confined to the apostles and the prophets. It's for us. His faithfulness promises. He keeps Kept them to Abraham. If you read through the book of Genesis, you're going to see how God's faithfulness begins there with Abraham and his descendants. Take, for example, Ishmael. Right, he's not the promised seed. He's not the one for the covenant. And yet God blessed him greatly, making him a great nation. Then there was Isaac, who was the promised one, and his sons Jacob and Esau. And Scripture says God hated Esau and he was not of the covenant, and yet there's a whole chapter in the book of Genesis dedicated to God's faithfulness to, G to Esau's sons, that he was a great nation. And that is God's promise to Abraham to make him a father of many nations was carried out as many nations come from them, and it extends here from the Jews to all nations. That includes all the Ishmaelites and the rest through the gospel. Why do I say that in here? Look at the very beginning. Shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Or all the lands. All the world is another translation. This is a psalm not written just to Jews. It's written to the whole world. All the nations are to worship him. And then what does it say of all nations? We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. This is a prophetic psalm. You never knew that. This is a prophetic psalm. That the gospel will go to all nations. All nations are his people. The promises of Abraham are fulfilled. 
in Christ Jesus. All nations, the sheep of his pasture. So God is God, and he's our God. He's the God of our children and all those who are far off. And these truths then form the foundation for our joyful worship, right? God is God, he's creator, we're not. So if you understand who God is and you recognize your own nature sinful, how can, how can, then you don't even really need the indicatives or the imperatives, right? They, they ought to come naturally. Get, again, consider the command to be joyful. At first glance, it seems absurd to command joy, yet Scripture does it. And it commands it, and it gives us what we need to obey the commands. Augustine used to uh, pray that prayer, God, command what thou will, and give us the grace to do what thou command. Now, we do need the command, though, because we are like sheep. When we go astray, and we become foolish, and so I've given you the indicatives. That just give me a few moments. We're going to walk very quickly through these seven commands so that you can see what our worship should look like. So if you start with God is God, you're not God, and all of his promises, this should be what comes from that. These seven things are what should happen in our worship time. These are what joyful worship should entail. And the first one is this, shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Some translations say, make a joyful noise to the Lord. That's a command that reoccurs throughout Scripture. Make a joyful noise. Shout. The Hebrew word for shout is this word that means to break. To break something with loud noise, akin to thunder breaking, piercing sound. It actually is a militaristic thing. Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah, says that God is a warrior and he shouts. And you remember here in Jericho when Joshua led the people around, what happened? They shouted. And so shouting was a means of and a celebration of victory. Thus, when you read about worship, one of the first things you need to know about our worship is that it needs to be loud, victorious, manly. There's another way to say it. Right? We come to worship acknowledging that our enemy has been defeated and our shepherd has won. Hallelujah. And so our worship should mirror this triumphant spirit. It shouldn't be weak. It shouldn't be effeminate. But militantly joyous. Our worship should be loud and manly. I know some people then they don't like drums because they're loud. And we've fixed that so they're not too loud because you can't hear if they're just, but still loud worship. This should be a joyous victory rally. You guys ever see the, those things in a rugby called a haku or haka? You should Google that on a, on a, um, did I not say it right? Haka, thank you. Yes. So this is an eyewitness description of those in a rugby match, okay? This is what he says. At the thrilling rugby match, the Haka, a mesmerizing and powerful traditional Maori war dance, unfolded before our eyes with all inspiring intensity. As the opposing teams faced off on the field, players from the indigenous New Zealand squad united in a synchronized display of fierce passion. With eyes ablaze and a face etched with determination, they stamped their feet, slapped their thighs, raised their voices in haunting chances, sending chills down the spikes of both fans and competitors alike. The Hawkeye's thunderous rhythm and defiant postures was a profound connection to their heritage and a profound challenge to their adversaries. It set the stage for a truly unforgettable and spine-tingling spectacle, this writer says about it. You watch this thing, dude. It's like they're shouting... It's very manly, it's not weak or gay at all, and it's pretty cool, okay? Similarly, when I was in Israel and I was at the Welling Wall, I saw the Jews worship there with lively dance, joyous music, collective shouting, 
And again, it wasn't, it wasn't the, the, like the pentecostal thing. If you go to them and they're kind of, sorry, they're kind of weak and effeminate, okay? This was manly. Almost reckless and yet in control, yelling and shouting. And not that the Jews get this right because they don't worship the right God. But if the Jews can shout at a wall, a bunch of Pacific Islanders can shout at a rugby game that nobody outside of them is going to watch. It's not going to matter after that. Why is our Reformed worship, or we have the gospel, so subdued? We've sometimes, I think, think that true reverence means quiet. Peace and quiet. And, and there are times to be quiet. The Bible says, be still, know that I am the Lord. And we start with a time of quiet in our service so that we can be reverent. But we still have times that we're to shout, right? Jesus Christ is King. Oh, come on. You, some of you know this. We've been over for now. Jesus Christ is King. All right. He is risen. Now, those are things in our liturgy, but they're not just like feigns there. They ought to be the shout of our heart. We are at war. And we are victory. We have victory in war. Right, we're marching from victory to victory, and we are an army of God. Shouldn't that make you want to shout, Jesus Christ is King? He's risen. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Our sins have been forgiven. Forget ourselves, please. Remember, we're not God. Many times we don't lift our hands in worship because we're worried about what others are going to think, and we come up with all kinds of pious-sounding reasons for why we don't do it, all right? Well, I'm afraid if I'll do it, I'll be showing off. Nobody's going to be watching. Who cares? Seriously? Forget yourself. Can you just think about God and what he's done for you? Can you think about he's forgiven your sins he died and rose again from the dead. That's way better than a rugby game. He's king. The nations will fall down before him. Who cares what the person beside you thinks? Now, don't be a jerk and ruin their worship by being over the top and fake. That's just as dumb. But we have this selfish, fake piety that makes us think that we should talk in hushed tones and not make eye contact with other people. like It's like a funeral. That's not the posture we're called to at Sovereign King Church. We are commanded. It is a command in Scripture. You see it? It's the very first word, shout. It's a command. Shout joyfully to the Lord. This is not a funeral. It's a triumphant procession celebrating victory over death. It was a funeral, but the funeral got ruined by the person coming back to life. Next, here is serve the Lord with gladness. So if the first part of our worship should be bold, loudly, manly, secondly, its essence is not self-centeredness, but service. True service to God and our brethren demands gladness in our hearts. And so a pivotal way to serve your brothers and sisters in worship is to come and worship with a spirit of joy and hospitality, Right? When we come to worship, we're not just here for ourselves. We're to serve with gladness. When you see visitors, welcome them. Go out of your way to bring them into worship. Help guide them. And not just because you're afraid that they come in here and we don't know who they are. Moreover, service in worship extends to our expression of faith. Like raising your hands, singing with vigor. You may not realize it, but those are acts of service to the Lord and to others. Like when I witness Daniel Nolan lifting his hands in worship, I know that he's not thinking, oh, I hope the pastor sees me. And if you are, gosh, how dumb that is. Rather, when I see that, it's an act of service to me because it inspires and encourages me, and I know you, to joyfully express the faith God has given us. So serve each other. By singing and worshiping, stop thinking about yourselves. 
serve each other with gladness. Our actions in worship here is not about a self-centered performance. This isn't like close your eyes tightly, immerse yourself solely in your personal experience. We're here to serve, to contribute to the worship of each other, to uplift each other and to worship the Lord. And it ought to be done with gladness. Like when you serve the church, it ought to be done with gladness, not merely executed as a perfunctory task. Duty, while commendable, is insufficient on its own. Now, duty is important. A man of honor keeps his word. True. But servile fear or mechanical compliance falls short of what God requires. Right? If you're only doing it out of mere rote duty, you need to repent and ask God to give you joy and gladness. Do that by shift from focusing on yourself to focus to God. Focus on who He is, what He's done. Right? If your jo- job is is to unlock the doors each week, put out the signs, do that with a smile and serve with gladness. If your job is to handle the slides, serve with gladness. Make sure the slides are right on time, crisp every single time so that the people of God can worship and nobody falls behind. If your job to lead worship, smile, please. Worship team, smile. If your job is to tidy up and you, nobody ever notices it, you're serving the Lord. He does. Do it with gladness. Don't seek human accolades. Serve Him with gladness. Every role, whether it's creating the weekly videos that we put out or a mother keeping your children engaged during worship, do that with gladness. Can we just serve with gladness? Again, I know it's easy to get into this rote thing, and, and when that is, let's stop and teach ourselves. Be joyful. I'm not God. God's God. He's the one I'm here to serve. Furthermore, the Scripture instructs us, come before Him with joyful singing. So our worship should be masculine, victorious, bold, accompanying service and selflessness, but it should also be beautiful. Like joyful singing. Consider a masterful painting where every stroke and collar blend harmoniously to create a breathtaking scene. That's what our worship is. Joyful singing. Each voice contributes to that painting, whether the voice is polished or raw some of us have more polished some a little bit more raw it all contributes right the beauty lies not in individual perfection but in our collective harmony our singing psalms hymns and spiritual songs together before him and if you doubt your ability to contribute to beautifulness let me offer you this this illustration so imagine a forest it's beautiful to look at but if you, get in, you look inside it, some of those trees may look pretty crooked. Some of them might just be stumps, right? They, and in the same way, every voice in our congregation, no matter how untrained or off-tune, it adds depth and texture to our worship. Now, we shouldn't want to stay there. You should work. I mean, it's a good thing to practice music. But just as the smallest tree still stands tall in the forest, so does each voice rise in significance when joined in worship. So you might think, I can't carry a tune in a bucket, yet consider this. Can you shout joyfully to the Lord? Can you follow along when the worship team leads? Hey, can you practice beforehand? Most of the time, we have our worship leaders, at least by Saturday, give you a list of the songs we're going to sing. So guess what that's for? So you get a notification in your app. That's what that's for. No. It's so that you can practice those songs and be ready to worship together. Remember, singing is a command from God. And if that's not enough, if you don't sing, you're a pansy. The next thing about worship, which is something we've already really focused on, is to know that the Lord himself is God. I've already emphasized that, but let me reiterate, our worship should be 
victorious, loud, manly, selfless, beautiful, but truthful. Truthful, theological. You know, different people tend to excel in different aspects of worship. We need to do them all, but we need to be theological. And that means our songs need to be deep truths. The words we use, the sermons we preach. And they should move us to think about God. Now, there's probably, you were probably thinking, I don't really need to say a lot about this to a group of Reformed people because we tend to focus on the mind. Yet, there's a way to focus on the mind and deep theological truth that is not actually focusing on deep theological truth because deep theology should move us to deep doxology. That is, deep truths of God should move us to worship, right? It's not just about engaging in debates over baptism or Bigfoot. Okay, it's about knowing and growing in our knowledge of God, our identity in Him, His promises, His faithfulness, His commands. And so theology should guide our worship. And theology that doesn't produce worship is vain. I'm coming to an end here, this quickly. The psalmist instructs us then, with another one, enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. And this follows his telling us that we are sheep, which is telling us the shepherd. And so as you think about entering the gates, maybe you would think about entering one of the historic gates of Jerusalem. But I think the context here is of the gate of the shepherd. And in ancient times, a sheep pen, they often had this open doorway. And that's where the shepherd would sit. So there was no gate because the shepherd was the gate himself. He would keep the sheep protected and the enemies out. He was the gate, which reminds us of what Jesus said. I am the gate. That is him. Thieves and try to enter the other way into the fold, but there's only one way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Any other way is illegitimate. And so our worship then must be not only manly, selfless, beautiful, truthful, but it must be focused on Christ. It must be focused on Christ. Worship devoid of the gospel is not worship, and it's not pleasing to God. There is no way to please God outside of faith. That doesn't mean we forcibly insert Jesus into every aspect, but rather he is the lens through which we interpret all scripture, including the Old Testament. And then all of our practical living teachings, whether about being a father or mother or whatever, they're actually us living out our faith in Christ. Christ is focus. So when we come to worship, entering his gates means you come through the gate. The only gate you can come is Christ. Because you're entering into his courts. Imagine entering the court of God. You're going to need a good advocate. You're going to need a good attorney. Because in the courts of Jerusalem, in the gates, is where the judgments would occur. So if you're going to come, you must come by Christ. Christ must be the focus. And then lastly here, there is two more commands, but I'm going to put them together. Give thanks to him, bless his name. So our worship should be loud, victorious, manly. It should be done with selflessness in service. It ought to be rich in theology. It ought to then be Christ-focused. And lastly, bless his name. It ought to be for the glory of God. It ought to be for the glory of God. The only way that could happen is if our hearts been transformed by the gospel... And then we can give thanks to him because everything we do is just a response to what he's done for us. And then we bless his name. This is for God's glory. And that means worship should be done according to his commands. We don't get to come on our own way and our own ways to worship God and come up with creative things. You know, I think what would really help our service is if we had puppets and stuff like that, right? That's not how we worship the Lord. We come according to his commands. Because his name is to be blessed. Worship is an act of honoring God. And therefore we have to worship as he commands. For he is the recipient of our worship. 
And so these are the ways that we are to worship, and they are all summarized as simply saying we are to worship with joy. Now, why isn't our worship and why isn't your worship always filled with joy? Well, again, it's our own self-preoccupation. We focus on ourselves, our own anxieties, our own fears. So as I end today, let me just call us all to repent. Let's repent of being selfish. Let's repent of thinking we're God. And when we repent, let's trust God to forgive us, and then let's worship with joy. Sovereign King Church, our time of worship should be heaven on earth. It should be a foretaste of what we will experience when we gather with all the saints. So may it be. Amen? Let's pray. God, you are God. We are not. We are sinful. We are selfish. We think about ourselves far too often when we ought to be focused merely on you in our worship. Lord, as we read this short psalm, there is so much to unpack there of your goodness and kindness towards us and how you command us to worship. Lord, I pray that you would fill us with joy, help us to worship loudly, with service, beautifully focused on the deep truths of your word. Lord, help us to worship with Christ as our focus and Christ as our Savior. And then, Lord, help us to give of ourselves as thanksgiving offerings to you, that your name would be blessed. God, forgive us our sins, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.